Good morning, everybody. Bet you didn't see this coming. <clears throat> Good, you neither did I. I woke up this morning uh, at a normal civilized hour. I, I'm not sure how that happened. And I said, you know what? Get some coffee, go work in the, in the Tarbis. And if I'm going to work in the Tarbis, what the heck? Let's make a, a coffee. But then I realized I'll be out here working in the Tarbis. And if I record this, then I got to go back in the house, load on the computer, put it and do all that. And leave. You know what? Just go live. And this is whole thing was unexpected. Let's just do it off the cuff. Um, this has no impact on my planned live stream uh, Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern. So, oh gosh, a uh, couple of things actually uh, worth talking about. Oh, the elixir of life. And let me just adjust that camera one more time. Try not to make everybody dizzy. Slowly. Good morning. Wow. I didn't actually think anybody would be up this early, including myself. Uh, hello, guys. Now, this is uh, being done straight off my phone, so no fancy graphics like last time. I'll, I'll save that for the Saturday show. So, oh, where to begin? Let's, let's uh, talk with a couple of, a couple of things. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Tom Daniel, TD, gave me this uh, kit bash he personally did with the Dornier. And, you know, said, run with it, Max. So I had a couple of zany ideas, like putting it in Blackhawks markings from the comic strip. But he told me that he'd actually intended it as like a Luftwaffe late war, Luftwaffe night fighter. And who am I to argue with the master? So uh, this will probably go in a semi-gloss black with late wartime Luftwaffe markings. I'm going through my stash looking for, I've got uh, enough stuff. I should be able to mark it up okay, some squadron markings and everything. Uh, so it'll probably be semi-gloss black. I still have to blow a canopy. My wife is, has this material she uses for her dolls. It's clear. It's, it's a plastic. The parent make a mold and vacuum form it. We'll see. Um, so the tentative plan is to put props on both ends, like the original 335. And I'm probably about to write a check. My nominal skills can't cash. But what I want to do is make... A set of gear doors so I can pose it on a stand and make the clear circle props and uh, get a couple of propellers and, and maybe just to both since it's supposed to be late worn upgraded maybe use four bladed props uh, and uh, make it uh, have gear doors that I can pluck out and a, and a landing gear I can stick on so I can pose it either on a stand or on its wheels and I'll probably put a fourth tail wheel on the back of bumper wheel which would you know that's why they had that uh, fin sticking down so you wouldn't get the rear prop. Same reason the Cessna Skymaster has the fin that sticks down. You know, when you go to the booms, the fin goes up and down. It's, it's to prevent a prop strike. Um, prop, well, actually, I, I was going to say I was probably going to leave the gun silver for contrast, but every German cannon I looked at is black. So the plane will probably be semi-gloss or maybe a flat black glare shield, maybe flat back, maybe flat black on bottom, maybe a couple of shades of black just so it'd be easier to photograph. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm thinking about making a mold of the gear doors, of the wheel wells, so that I can get the dimensions right and everything for the gear doors. Or I might just, I might just make an etching. <clears throat> I'm really looking forward to get, getting started on this. Uh, but I want to take my time with it, so this won't be done for a while. But uh, I'm just, I, I'm just giggly that uh, I get to work on a TD, a Tom Daniel design, an original. The hands of the master did this work. God, it's, look at that. It's bloody flawless. You can't see seams where he did the wings or anything. Um, uh, while I'm on that subject uh, of, of Tom Daniel, a couple of viewers had made a suggestion, which I think is a great idea. If any of you guys out there have built or have pictures of old builds or whatever of any of the Tom Daniel designs, the monogram cars or anything, Go ahead and send them to maxismodels at yahoo.com and I'll put together a Tom Daniel viewer build. And I already have one of the Rommel's rods one of you guys did uh, with the girl standing by, the, which is just, the workmanship is incredible. I was wondering, was that figurine, is that is that one you bought or did you make that figurine? Because 
that was that's impressive work um actually it was so impressive that now i feel like i need to bring my rommel's rod back to the shop and start touching it up more because i just put a quickie sitting in the desert paint scheme on it and now you've got me wanting to hyper detail it which brings us to the next thing the peggy hans peter if you're looking if you're watching uh here's the peggy and uh i made the mistake last night of going on lot of oh, oops okay a piece dropped but it didn't make the floor it's on a torpedo hookup so i'm making this a torpedo bomber uh i made the mistake last night of going online and looking at some builds of the peggies because i wanted to see the best ways to paint it and of course they're your kind of typical hyper detailed kits that you know or the it's like it's absolutely maddening to see some of the beautiful work people do and you're like i can't make one that well but oops okay it's gonna have to be fitted but um one of the things i saw was uh, somebody built uh, these and every single one of these rivet lines and there's a lot of them especially the ones going you know uh vertical uh had been had the little weather streaks on it and it was a 170 second scale same as this and it looked like it was airbrushed but how on God's green earth, did someone streak the weather that perfectly? And uh, I'm like, good Lord, that, that's not building a model. That's surgery. Um, so I, I don't know if you, you guys can probably, yeah, you can see the table here. All the parts, as you guys may remember, this kit came in a bag. So I just kind of put all the parts here. A few of the uh, pieces, like, like some of the pilot figures, had little faces painted. So... Uh, I guess Hans Peter's father did a little bit of work on it before he bagged it. Um, <laughs> there's the cool little fuel truck that comes with it. That is so awesome. Uh, go gray like the M2. Well, the reason for uh, doing the semi gloss black was, is, uh, as you know, uh, TD uh, designed the, a lot of the vehicles largely for looks. And although he said it'd be harder to photograph well, he thought he would that would be a. Uh, um, uh, you know, just have, for lack of a better word, sort of imposing, maybe even sinister look to it. I do have the Horton Knockjäger uh, Night Fighter, which is uh, the, which they never actually built, but it was. Oh gosh, I got the box top over there, but it's blocked. I can't. For, it might. It might be a Rebel kit. Anyway, it's the two seater with the radar, and that one has a uh, black gray camo scheme but uh, what i'm thinking is if, if i do do it all in semi-gloss black then if at some point i want to change it i can still add a gray or either a splinter pattern or an airbrush pattern to it um the uh it's just we'll see but i want to do it justice for sure and I'm just giggly with excitement. Oh yeah, one other thing I thought I might do to it, since I can make the rear prop just you know slide in, slide out, doesn't have to be glued into place. Uh, I can just hold it in a little rubber cement or something um, temporarily. What I thought I might also do is see about making a sleeve and a scoop that I could put on it so that the rear engine would be a jet engine, so you have the option of a prop or a jet in the rear, so it could be a hybrid aircraft. I'm just all full of bad ideas. But uh, the question isn't whether or not it'll look cool. The question is whether or not I have the modeling schools, skills to pull it off. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of cool things. You know, I'm, a half, I'm halfway inclined to get more mold-making equipment and make a cast of this thing so I can repop versions of, you know. Um, uh, <sighs> but uh, I'm not entirely sure I could pull it off since it's already built. But uh, I gotta go through my spare stash and see what kind of landing gears I've got. Also, oh, morning, morning, morning. Oh, thank you guys for checking in. Oh, wow. Oh, well, we got 23 people watching. I, I thought I was gonna be here by myself. Like I say, the only reason I decided to go live was just because I'm not gonna be able to get back in the house for a while to upload it. And I figured, why not actually do a coffee while I'm drinking my coffee instead of, you know, getting it up at lunchtime? So, um, but anyway, uh, 
if you guys have built any Tom Daniel kits, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's a TD design, just go ahead and send me a picture of it. I don't care how good or bad the build is. You know, I don't care if you made it when you were six. The whole idea is, let's see if we can get enough to put together either a viewer's uh, um, build or or a segment in a viewer's build of TD designs. <clears throat> and I'm including like the Atlantis, the newer, you know, uh, Red Baron tea bucket, anything that was. Uh, from the, the fertile mind of, of Tom Daniel. And just a reminder, guys, it's Tom Daniel, not Daniels, which I, like everybody else, keep saying it's... Uh, um, so uh, I, I need to uh, map out a strategy because right now I have the Buffalo, the B-47, the Tremulous, the Saturn V, the Launch Umbilical Tower, the Peggy, the Dornier. So that's seven open kits, and I'm probably missing one. Oh, yeah, the Vostok, which almost doesn't count. That makes eight. It's hard to motivate yourself to work on that Vostok, that old, old round shift kit from, I think, East Germany, because it's just it's just so rough. Um, and, and you go online, you see all these magnificent builds people have done. You're like, mine's not going to look like that when it's done. But remember, build for yourself. You know what really motivates me sometimes to make better models? Envy. I see other work that other people do, and I go, gosh, I wish I could make one like that, and it makes me work that much harder. Ah, envy and greed. They built the world. So, um, I have all six of those posters that I put, that I showed you last time. I have them under that, the, uh, uh, in that big frame temporarily. At least I could look at them. Um, so many airplanes, I guess. <laughs> this is our, uh, Life is more fun on the dark side. Just ask the count. Uh, the one, the two, the three. Um, oh, wow. I'm really in the mood to build a tank, too. i got to get started. I've got two tanks. i got that uh, Tamiya Walker Bulldog M41, and I've got that uh, Monogram Panzer IV. I don't know why I'm such a... You never you just don't notice sometimes you just get in the mood to build something. It doesn't, you know, like, oh, I want to build a car today, or I want to build a tank. You just... You just Get in that mood. Oh, you made it. Welcome from Clay County. Well, glad to see you. Um, two of you guys have uh, asked me for something. And remember, I still need to get your mailing address before I can send them to you. So uh, once you email me that, I'll drop them in the mail. And we have, uh, where, oh yeah. You know, one thing I suppose I could do is take some close-ups of the Mania uh, Kate torpedo plane and the uh, Nito one so you can get a better idea what I was talking about from those little photos I had up there yesterday. The only problem is if I take really good photos, you guys will see just how mediocre my builds are. Um, mm. You want to ground an airline, just break the coffee pot. Yeah, I got up this morning and uh, started studying, and I've done so much studying lately that uh, I, uh, it's to the point now I just get in the morning just gloss through the stuff for about an hour ago over the limitations or something or, or the procedures, and and after that your brain's like, dude, you know this, and it shuts down. So still waiting to hear back from the training department. They could call during this uh, live stream, or they, I mean, I hear from for a month. I just got to make sure I'm still getting paid. Um, not really sure. I, anyway, no, that's my problem. You don't hear about that. So, uh, I will say one thing for LSL. Actually, you know, I, I mentioned this last night. I'm actually kind of impressed with these LS kits, give, given the generation that they were made in and everything. They don't have a lot of detail. They have very good instructions. Doesn't leave a lot to question. And, uh, they have a nice history on the airplane and everything. Uh, from 44, I didn't realize the Peggy was such a late war design. Yeah, apparently from the middle of 44 around the close Pacific War strain, yeah, that's when it came out. And they made, uh, over 700 of the things. And they were learning. They put the, uh, looks like a, the equipped 13 millimeter, basically a 50, 51 caliber in the back of the thing. So they were learning to upgun their bombers. And, uh, but the Peggy... The one thing about this airplane that's so intimidating, but it's also what makes it so cool, is it has an extremely uh, complex uh, nose and tail 
uh, framing pattern around the glazed area of the glass. Let me see if I can find a decent picture. So, well, yeah, here we go. Um, you can see how much glazing there is on there. Every piece of that frame's got to be painted two colors. You know, I've got to paint uh, the interior color first and then the exterior color. Because of that much glass, you really need to paint the interior color so because you're going to be able to see it. And uh, but overall, it hasn't it hasn't really been you know, just the tiniest bit of flash on a few parts. The detail's good. The fit is is pretty good. Uh, the little filings you would expect, and um, the uh, it's just it's just I had never built an LS model before. Where is it? It's right here. Before I built this Susie for the uh, Battle of Midway uh, documentary that I did, and I don't even know if I even used it in it. And uh, uh -uh, time to start dusting. And uh, I, I don't even remember building this thing. I was building so many models at the time. I'm not sure I didn't get those roundels a little too much inboard. Uh, well, I went off the building guide, I think. But uh, so, unfortunately, I didn't leave much of a memory because I was building so fast. But now that I'm building this one, which is so detailed and has so many extra features, I have to admit, I know I did the background on LS, but I did it after only having built one kit. But now that I'm building more LS kits, I'm... I, I'm pretty impressed with them. Uh, well, not flawless, but uh, definitely uh, they, they put their heart and soul in the, into getting it right. Um, for those who didn't know, this Suzy, which of course has an inline engine, which was very rare for Japanese naval aircraft. Uh, it's a little known fact that uh, one or two, and I think two of these were actually present at the Battle of Midway. They were still prototyped. And... Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it was one of these that spotted the American fleet and then had radio failure and had to fly all the way back to, hey, we found the fleet. Um, but it was uh, the, the the later model, and I actually, well, I have a poster here uh, of the of the Suzy. You'll see a later model made a lot more of them with radial engines, so it looks kind of funny to have this airplane and then they pluck off that inline engine because this was designed to be a fast, it was supposed to be both a dive bomber and a reconnaissance aircraft, and speed, it was, you know, they were trying to get rid of the, the idea that dive bombers always went slow, they were trying to make it, and they did make it genuinely fast, like almost fighter plane fast dive bomber. It carried the it carried its bomb in a bomb bay. It, they, they really ha were on the right track there, but the, the Japanese just had a lot of trouble keeping those copies of the Damlier Benz engine working. And they found it to be more grief than it was worth, so they put a radial engine on it, and then we called, I think we called that the Judy, I believe. Uh, and there's actually a couple of those still around. In fact, there's one in California undergoing restoration. Um, but I, I don't know if there's any Suzy still around, or at least there's certainly none flying. There might, I think there might be one in Japan in a museum. And uh, if I remember, I'll, I'll put the link up at some point. You guys may recall I was talking about uh, we crushed all those German. Uh, um, <laughs> it's alive. Um, I was talking about those um, uh, all those captured German aircraft that were crushed after the war that were at Freeman Field, and a lot of them went to O'Hare. Somebody sent me a really great article about apparently they're digging some of them up, and just to add a a little flourish, uh, there's some detail. Apparently, store, you know, all these things are coming back. All these planes are coming back after the war. Storage was an issue. Once they were done testing the airplanes, they were just old enemy aircraft. They didn't really need them. Yeah, they pulled a few aside from museums, but a bunch of them were taken to O'Hare just for storage. So when they were doing the landfill for the runway, that's apparently why they got, you know, just uh, crushed. But when they were told to dispose of them, there wasn't really a definition of what dispose meant. Ah, uh, glue trooper, salute. Um, so, apparently, I think I think he said it was a Freeman Field. I have to find that that article. It's a really good article. But they just dug pits and dropped the planes in them and covered them up. Um, of course, I imagine a lot of them had been disassembled or something. But apparently, a few years ago, some people started looking for them. Well, more than a few years ago, probably 20, 30 years ago, people started looking for them. Apparently, recently, they just found some stuff. Not any complete airplanes. But they found some engines and parts and stuff. So that's something. Uh, but that, was, I think, was at the old Freeman Field. There's no way you're going to tear up a runway at O'Hare. 
Uh, Judy, 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 Judy. Um, apparently, uh, Goober said that more times than Cary Grant did. Um, if you guys know the Judy, 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 Judy. Um, so, uh, the, the, that's pretty interesting stuff. And, uh, of course, a lot of the stuff got melted down for, uh, uh, you know, because it was valuable metal. In fact, uh, Simon Whistler over at uh, Mega Projects, uh, he's the, the ball guy with the beard that does a lot of history videos. He does, he does several different channels, Mega Projects and, and some others, uh, biographics. Fun guy to listen to. Anyway, I was just watching last night. He did one on the Cher Gustav, the big, big gigantic railgun, uh, Dora and Cher Gustav. And uh, apparently, uh, one of the, uh, those guns, because they're made of so much steel after the war, a lot of them got melted. He was talking about, they're not sure to this day, no one's sure if they built one or two of the guns. Some people say Schwer Gustav, that door was a nickname for Schwer Gustav and other people say, no, there were two guns. And then there was that long range barrel, that hundred kilometer range barrel they were supposed to make for it. Well, apparently a lot of that stuff got uh, melted down because so much steel was involved. Um, when you're too jittery to paint, too jittery to glue, it's time to use the spray gun and do a camo pattern. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, you know, you think if something as big as a freaking rail gun can disappear and nobody really knows what happened to it, uh, although apparently the Russians did take a bunch of stuff they grabbed back for study, but even there, no one knows what happened. It was probably melted down because it was still a lot of valuable steel, but it, it's hard for us to imagine a day where we keep records on everything. I mean, you go to the you go to the convenience store and you get a, a receipt that's a time, date, stamp, credit card. I mean, you can virtually be tracked by your purchases. It's hard for us to believe that there was a time when you could lose track of something as big as a rail gun or a bomber, but it happens, you know, especially back then, uh, especially given the chaotic nature. Uh, and there was a lot of skullduggery. We don't want somebody to know we got this, so sometimes records are deliberately misleading which drives historians nuts. But the, um, the, uh, I can, I try not to judge these people for just destroying these airplanes. It's just not only as a, an amateur historian, as a pilot, but just to join think all the work it goes to build one of these things. How can you just crush it or destroy it or melt it down or sell it off as junk? I mean, of course, I see that from the point of view of a person who loves vintage airplanes. And, uh, but, uh, at least, at least to his credit, uh, Hap Arnold, who, who, as I recall, passed away just after the war, uh, did tell the Air Force to, um, to save one of everything because he had, he did plan on a museum at some point. And he did understand the significance of the, uh, of, history and, and holding on to Sam. That's why the Air Force Museum has such a good collection. Uh, the Navy, since flying is secondary in the Navy and doesn't get the emphasis, I mean, because they are the Navy, that makes sense. That's why they don't have samples of some of their aircraft. And uh, they just, they, when they were done with them, they were just, look, they're in the way. We and, and in defense of the military decision to get rid of this old equipment, anything you hold on to, you got to take care of. And you're operating on a budget. You have a mission to accomplish, and your mission is to defend the United States. Having these old airplanes laying around just, you know, isn't part of that mission. They're in the way now. They're, they're, they're even if just it's just a parking spot, they're taking up resources. And it sounds weird, but having places to park can be an issue. In fact, I'll tell you a, a classic example of that. Uh, a friend of mine who sadly passed away, <clears throat> only 51 years old. Um, and uh, in better shape than me, ooh, there's a thinker, um, had, was flying missions. He was a contract pilot flying missions out in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, he was flying a surveillance plane, King Air, uh, with surveillance pods on it, just flying around in circles, monitoring, you know, part of the countryside. And uh, everything, since they operated out of the military base in Afghanistan, everything, of course, is very tightly controlled. You're only allowed to go like five miles an hour on the base in a vehicle. I mean, wearing out, you know, transmissions on trucks. But anyway, that's that point. Uh, uh, parking, as big as Afghanistan is, as big as the airfield was, parking still becomes an issue. You get a lot of aircraft in there. 
and there's they actually have trouble where we're going to store the aircraft, especially when the haboobs, the the, the the bad weather comes in when they get the sandstorms. So they may be in Iraq. Anyway, point being that uh, there's only so much hangar space. Everybody's parked on the ramp. There's only so much ramp space. And you tend to forget how big some of these planes are. And apparently, uh, some uh, what what's the Air Force Learjet? Is that the C thirty one? I forget. Anyway, uh, some Air Force Learjet had parked in a revetment or something, and I don't know what the story was on if he was supposed to be there or not, but uh, apparently an F-16 unit commander came in, and that was like his parking spot, and he didn't have a place to park his jet. It became a bit of a to-do, and, and Ray said he comes into the ops the next day, and there's this big thing pinned up in the bulls for where whoever parked your Barbie jet in my spot, blah, 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 all these penalties that'll be done, and, and then I was like, Barbie jet, I love that. That's why they used to call my CRJ was the Barbie jet. And uh, in fact, Quick tangent. I guess I should change positions to do a tangent. Quick tangent. 20 years ago, uh, my then, uh, before I met my current wife, my, my girlfriend bought gifts for my nieces for Christmas, and it was uh, a Barbie. And I thought, I thought it was uh, like Barbie flight attendant Barbie. She goes, oh, and I was a first officer on the jet. She goes, oh, no, 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 that's pilot Barbie. Oh, oh okay. And then she goes, and look, sweetie. Barbie's in the left seat. I was like, <laughs> woman. Anyway, uh, let me see if that brings up the, no, okay. Um, I'm not touching you. Um, so, uh, uh, parking, parking is a big deal. Eating up space is a big deal. So here you are. It's 1946, 47. You've tested the equipment. You've got all the data you need from it. More planes are probably still pouring in from Europe. I mean, like, well, just get rid of this crap. You're not thinking about 50 years down the road, people might want to see one in a museum. And so I, I don't blame the people for the decisions they made. And don't forget, military budgets got really slashed. They wanted their peace dividend after the war. They were closing military bases left and right because, well, they were a wartime necessity. A lot of them had been training bases. So here you're stuck with the stuff that, you know, you're like, just make it go away. Handle it, Roy. Handle it. Handle it. Um... Captain, make those planes go away. Yes, sir. And that's the end of it. You know, a year ago, you were shooting these things out of the sky. And the idea of preserving one, why? Because um, your grandkids may want to know what you fought against. And also, they'll be worth $3 million. But, uh, so, I am sure 50 years from now, we'll all be getting killed. Why didn't you say those? Here's an example in your project. Why didn't you save your old IBM computer? You know, the old, you know, monochrome monitor. It was just a piece of junk. Well, now it's a rare item in a museum and none of them even work. I mean, it's, and I'm getting old because I'm seeing computers that I can remember being advertised on TV or my friends having in museums and everybody's amazed. Oh, it still works. And they're like, oh gosh, I wish we could get more parts for this. I'm like, oh God, do you have any idea how many landfills are full of the parts you're looking for? And uh, so I, I can't really bash the guys for, for trashing the old airplanes, but it still just breaks my heart. And of course, let's say you do get a bunch of old airplanes. Who's going to take care of them? Who's going to maintain them? How are you going to keep them from rusting in place? Now you need, you know, climate controlled buildings. And this is why museums need funding. People are like, what does a museum need all this money for? It's just a bunch of parked airplanes. You know how much it costs to run the air conditioner in a, in a hangar that, in a building that size? And, uh, so I try not to judge <laughs> somewhere out there right now is probably, well, actually I was about to say it's probably a Messerschmitt or a Focke Wolf or some rare German airplane or Japanese airplane in, in really good condition. Actually, some of the best conditioned aircraft are stored at the bottom of freshwater lakes and they're still pl every, you know, they're, they're plucking them out. Yeah, I can understand that, but it makes think about how much steel it goes to take a warship, even just a destroyer, a light cruiser. I mean, how many, how much consumer good can be made out of that? And that's high quality steel too. Um, there's a reason that wreckers spend all that money, um, uh, you know, to to cut those things apart. We're talking about, good God, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of tons of high grade steel, and. Uh, 
that's you when you think when you think about what goes into building a ship or an airplane, just the idea of one eating a torpedo and going to the bottom breaks your heart. Never mind somebody who's letting one languish. Last time I was in Philadelphia, they still have, I think it's the USS Des Moines in storage. And this is a World War II cruiser. And I want to say it's a, not a light cruiser, but it's a cruiser. Not a, it might be a heavy cruiser. I think it's just a cruiser. Um, and of course, it's, you know, it just looks so cool sitting there, so majestic with, you know, the turrets and the guns and everything. And uh, I'm like, yeah, gosh, somebody turned that into a museum ship. And then you look at what it takes to turn a military vessel into a museum ship. And it's a, it's a miracle that it ever happens. And by the way, uh, the late great Bull Halsey, uh, I believe it was Halsey, after World War II, the, uh, the famous USS Enterprise, the last of the uh, Yorktown class aircraft carriers, and I think to this day still the most decorated ship in, in naval history, American naval history. Aluminum siding came from, yeah, yeah. I'll watch the movie uh, Best Years of Our Lives. At the end where all the B-17s are out in the, you know, getting chopped up. And, then, and I think the guy mentions they're being turned into house, prefab housing or something, you know, plowshares, you know, swords into plowshares. And, uh, of course, there were thousands of them. But uh, it's, I'm just glad they saved a few. But, but anyway... Uh, Halsey wanted the uh, Enterprise turned into a museum ship. And, and being the big national hero that he was and everything, he, he even he couldn't, didn't have the horsepower. The, the reason they were retiring the Enterprise wasn't that it was still, well, be, the ship was only 10 years old. It was still perfectly serviceable. The problem was jets were coming in. The new Essex class carriers were just big enough for them. And the Enterprise was simply too small. But um, the, uh, the they just couldn't they just couldn't modernize it like they could the other ships, and so they went into mothballs. And and uh, the only part of that ship that's left, I think, that took the bell off of it, which I think is at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. But uh, and it got sliced and diced. I mean, in the end, it's just a lot of raw material. But uh, I've been aboard uh, an Essex class. I actually did a, a video of my tour of the. Um, uh, the second you well the second aircraft carrier named Yorktown which is which is Essex class which is at uh, in Charleston South Carolina well you, you, you got a tour of that if you get the chance and one of the things that makes that one great is they'll let you down in the engineering spaces so you can go down and, and see it you, you realize hundreds of men work down there and uh, my hat is off to anyone who can who can work down in one of those noisy hot sweaty engine rooms for 10 hours 12 hours a day of USS Ling, I'm not sure. Are they are making a new USS? Oh, I hope so. Um, what was that old comment by Riker? A God watches over uh, children, fools, and ships named Enterprise. Um, yeah, now, the, the North Carolina is a battleship in North Carolina, Wilmington. I have not been on that. I've been on some battleships. I haven't been on that one. I think that was a treaty ship, so uh, it had less armor, than, which is really what separates it from the Iowa class. Uh, it had, I think, 16 inch by 45 caliber rifles, where the Iowa's had 16 by 50s. And just in case you don't know, when you when you see that, it, it's confusing because you think a caliber, you think a pistol or a rifle. Uh, what that means is it's that the barrel length is that many times is that many times the uh, the bore. So a 16 inch by 50 caliber rifle means the bore is 16 inches and the barrel length is 16 inches times 50. And that, and the longer, of course, that extra uh, few feet on the barrel holds the traps, the gases longer and, and allows the, the shell to fly farther. And it may have a larger breach on it. Um, but, uh, some of that had to do with treaty limitations also. I forget what it was, uh, how many, 45,000 tons or something was the limit for a battleship under the treaty. And of course, everybody cheated. But after the war broke out, okay, pfft, treaty limitations are out the window. And that's when they came up with the Iowa class. And they were going to make the Montana, which would have had 12 guns, two turrets in front, two turrets in back. And uh, yeah, they actually, I think they, I think they laid the keel for it, but then the war was ending. So it was broken up. And, you know, battleships are 
god awful expensive to operate. But with modern technology, the battleships are just what the name implies. The, the amount of whoop ass they carry is unbelievable. And you have to remember that modern ships are not armored like the old ones because everything's gotten so high tech that you, you, you mean missiles with 100, 200 mile range, everything from exosets to every kind of any ship missile. A lot of people are like, yeah, okay, now a ship survival is stealth and speed. <clears throat> so they had to get rid of, they got rid of a lot of the armor because they, they figured it was redundant. But now we're so geared towards that. It, it's kind of funny in a way. Tanks and ships went in opposite directions. Now, mind you, this is my limited knowledge. I'm sure some of you know a lot more about this than I do. But ships got thinner skins, higher speeds, and a lot more defensive capability. Um, like the, the Gatling guns and everything that you know can take out incoming stuff and the anti-ship missiles. Tanks, on the other hand, the, the armor just got heavier and heavier and heavier, and the guns got more powerful and more powerful. Whereas the ships, the guns got smaller and smaller. I think three inch. Few of them have five inches. A lot of them have three inches, and they're semi-automatic guns. But uh, but the average uh, a lot uh, frigates, I think, had three inch guns, and destroyers had five inch guns. And it's very capable, very far more capable than its ancestors. But it's still just a five inch gun with so much range on it. But the uh, as we've seen, these things can't, I mean, you look at the USS Stark and the Cole, and the ships just aren't that well armored. They can't be. Well, destroyers never really were. Uh, but the battleships considered archaic. But the irony of that is, and I don't know how true this is, but a couple of old sailors, maybe they were just bragging, but they were telling me that, ironically, most of the hits that have damaged our warships, the Cole, the Stark, um, uh, the things like SSS missiles, really wouldn't do that much damage to a World War II battleship because they have that, that citadel around them, that, that thick armor belt, that modern weapons are not made to penetrate. Those ships aren't armored that well today. You don't, you don't have to have uh, a 16-inch shell slam into Well, actually, one of the things that made the Iowa class with its citadel the truest of the true battleships was... If I remember this correctly, it's one of the few ships that had enough armor to defend itself from its own shell. So if an Iowa class hit another Iowa class in armor belt, it wouldn't go through. Um, so is the claim. I'm I'm not standing by that. That's just what you know stuff I've read. But uh, so if you if you were to take a modern battleship, I mean, a, take a, a World War II style battleship modernized into combat, uh, it would actually probably, depending on who you believe, would be a pretty survivable vessel. Even a torpedo hit probably wouldn't bring it down. Everybody talks about, well, torpedoes go off underneath and lift it out of the water and break the spinal. Something that big and that heavy that's compartmentalized like that, that still may not, you know, I mean, enough of them will bring anything down, but it took, what, 10 torpedoes to sink the Masashi? Um, I know there were World War II torpedoes, but all I'm getting at is, is that modern weapons are made for uh, the modern battlefield to, to, to attack modern systems. And if you bring in this old system that relied on just thick steel and brute force, it may turn out to be more of a, a boogeyman for the bad guy than because they're not because they're not equipped for that threat. Now I could be wrong. Um, the exact opposite is the case with tanks. Uh, a modern tank is in every regard superior to uh, to an old one. I mean, they're they're faster. They're they're more powerful. They they have better guns. They have better armor. Um, an old school tank has zero advantage, well, be cheaper, I suppose, but uh, it, realistically on the battlefield, it has zero advantage over a new tank, whereas a, a World War II fighting ship might actually uh, have uh, some advantages over modern stuff. Um, the uh, and, and before anybody brings up the Belgrano, the one that was sunk in uh, the uh, uh, Falklands incident, remember that was a cruiser much, basically, as my nephew liked to say, cruisers, glorified destroyers. So, um, Conquer, I think it was Conquer, took that out with a single torpedo, but that was, you know, a, a much smaller, much less armored ship. Now, I could be completely wrong. One modern torpedo may, or Exocet missile may take out a battleship. Obviously, I don't have the specs. I'm sure all that's classified, but um, this, is, this, is, this is the way the old sailors are talking. And maybe it's just guys that are nostalgic for their ships, but 
it does make you wonder if we've gone about uh, naval technology the right way. And, uh, well, the Navy knows more about it than I do, so I'm sure they've done. I'm sure they've they've done the right thing. But and modern weapons are so bloody lethal. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons so many of us are so fascinated with World War II aviation, maybe let's say Korean War era of Vietnam, is because you had machines that were genuinely high performance machines that looked good. I mean, they're they're let's face it, World War II aircraft are just sexy. Uh, you know, they're macho, they're sexy, but the fact that they had guns. It still took the skill of a pilot, you know. So you had a guy with, you know, if you had an ace, you're talking about someone who had some some serious skills, was mixing it up with the bad guys. I mean, we're talking about the real macho, you know, knights of the air kind of stuff. Today, you're 100 miles away, beep, you know, and a famous fighter slash test pilot. I won't I won't say his name because I don't want to drag him into this, but he's a World War II veteran, Korean Vietnam veteran, and famous test pilot. Made the comment that. With modern systems, you know, pretty much it's lock the radar and push a button. It, it, it's it's not real, you know, it's not the kind of uh, individual skill that was required. And whereas I understand his point of view about, yeah, but you have to remember, it isn't the the military's mission to uh, provide for jousting of knights of the air. It's the military's mission to take out the enemy in the most effective way possible. So our systems are superior. Uh, but what winds up happening is, is, is uh, this is going to be most of the, one of the most idiotic sounding things I've ever said, but there's a certain loss of romance. Not that war should ever be romantic, but the fact that just any anybody can hit a button and go, boom, you know, my missile's better than your missile instead of my pilot's better than your pilot. And all that happens is, is it just sort of loses some of its, uh, it loses some of the human quality. And while I'm talking about this, I have absolutely no idea. Um, now, back to models. Uh, I'm probably going to do the olive drab paint scheme with the gray bottom on this. That's saying, there is a brown paint scheme on this that I thought about also. But most of the brown paint schemes I've seen are, are very weathered. And I'm if I paint it brown, I'm going to be inclined to want to weather it. And I'm pretty sure that's either going to be an extremely lengthy process or I'll be honest with you I'm just afraid of kind of screwing it up whereas a lot of the olive drab ones the weather apparently doesn't show as much on the olive drab so you can get by with a little bit less and and uh, baby steps I should probably do that plus I think the olive drab was a more common paint scheme also the olive drab just uses the roundels and the decal sheet for this just has the roundels the brown ones always have the big white backings on them I'd have to uh, paint that because here's the decal sheet for it, and uh, it's not bad. These look like they're these look like they may be usable. I'll uh, test a couple of them, and if they're usable, I'll use them. And it oh look at that! You got individual numbers. I just noticed that. Um, I've got this uh, restore film. If I have to, this is the uh, micro scale liquid decal film for restoring old decals. And my experience is this stuff does work pretty well. Um, sometimes you can get away, like I say, with just a couple of coats of clear coat. Sometimes that does it. Depends on the condition of the decals. I have yet to have one that that restore film, because it puts a whole new film over it. Now, the thing to remember about that is you have to trim out the decal, because it just covers it like a blank sheet. Um, so, uh, let me see. Now, oops, just toppled that over. So, uh, I have a couple of models I have to dig out, and I'd like to shoot some decent green screen for uh, doing another intro with the Tarbis, but uh, if you guys saw last night, the, the reason that, that that green screen was so pathetic was I literally just set the thing on a, on a green board and twirled it around and, and took some footage of it, uh, very quick and dirty because I had so much going on. Uh, if you ever want to photograph your model against a green screen or, you know, to chroma key it out, there's a lot of videos on setting up chroma key. But uh, one of the things uh, that I, I highly recommend uh, is you really need to be about seven feet away from the background. And it helps to have a light behind what you're doing to, to shine a light to give you lit edges. And that 
also blocks out some of the reflected green. So you want a lot of light on the subject, at least one backlight, and then that'll help you out a lot if you're going to chroma key. Of course, if my guess is if you're doing chroma key, you probably already know that. I'm rolling over my mic cable. Ah, so anywho, what else we got going on here? Um, nah, 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 nah. Gosh, I'm starting to get airplanes. You know, I hate to do this, but <laughs> I, was, I actually was thinking about doing a Wizard of Oz parody for another one, you know, the, the, the Twister and everything. I just thought with the Tarvis Doctor Who was a little more uh, on point. Now, uh, let me, okay, watch yourself. I'm going to turn the camera, try to do it slowly. Whoops. Okay. There's the uh, stash of empty boxes. Now, those are all the completed ones. I'm getting to the point where I'm out of storage space. I'm going to have to start clearing off some of these shelves, and I'm wondering what I'm going to do with all these. They're kind of part of the decor, um, but at the same time, I could really use that shelf. So I like to display the empty boxes, the ones I've already built. You know, it's kind of like a fighter pilot putting kill markings down the side of his plane, you know? Um, and uh, I'm trying to... Whoops, whoa, wrong way almost said a bad word because <laughs> I do that sometimes. Um, I get close. I Max in space. Uh, yeah, you can fold the boxes, but a lot of them still have the bottoms to them. So of course I can put some inside of others. Uh, it just seems like when you unfold them, they're never quite, I don't know. Why am I being, why am I being so worried about it? It's not like there's a shortage of empty airplane boxes. Half of these are just uh, repops anyway. I don't know. It's Normally, I would just start gluing them to the walls, but I run out of space. I, I thought about that, and I might do that. If I do that, uh, that, that could work. Um, I actually have considered that. In fact, bringing up that very point, let me just spin this around and show you that I've, uh, whoops. Let me see. Okay. I got to get over here and see what the camera's seeing. Okay. Just stepped on the mic cable again. Lowest production values on the internet, folks. I'm proud of it. Yeah. You see, I've got the uh, tail of my RC0 stuck to the ceiling. And, uh, that's, um, that is uh, probably going to be the next phase. I, 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 I don't know if you guys noticed. Oh, oh, I wish these comments wouldn't disappear so quick. Okay. Stash is mixed with planes, tanks. Yeah. 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 That, well, most of, a lot of these are just uh, need a second story tarps. We don't tip me. They don't allow that in Duval County. I actually looked into it. Uh, a lot of those are actual boxes on the wall, and some of them are just fronts. But if you might, if, I don't know if you get there's a little bit of glare on it, but uh, I re just yesterday rearranged the back wall a little bit. That uh, Lindbergh poster of the B-17 went up, and I put up the XP-50 and the PT-7 from ODK to add a little new variety. Uh, I still have a few open spots up there, and... Uh, Something as big as like the Star Trek boxes, the Godzilla box. I don't, I don't think there's going to be room for those. Uh, but uh, maybe the smaller Godzilla box. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, let's see. Let's go this way. Whoa. Okay. Um. Of course, I've got the big box, the Polar Lights Godzilla. But uh, NPC. Whoa. Careful. I, the other day I said I didn't have any multi-engine Japanese aircraft in twin engine. I do have the Emily. Uh, it's in my, it's actually right there in the, in the glass case. Uh, MPC found an interesting way to repop their old uh, recoilless rifle Jeep. The, uh, it comes with a paper cutout of Godzilla in the towers. And it's actually pretty cool. I mean, it's just paper. It's, it's not super detailed. But, um... But, but it's just the exact same recoilless rifle jeep they've always made, but they threw in a decal sheet with the Earth Defense Force markings or military markings. And I put the Earth Defense Force markings on it because, you know, I already had a, a jeep and, and army markings. But um, this is from Godzilla versus the Astro Monster. And let's see, they, yeah, they actually show on the side the clips where the recoilless rifle jeep is in the movie. Uh, that's where he's fighting Ghidorah, I think. But uh, 
the thing only has a few seconds of screen time, but it was enough for them to, to do that. And from a marketing standpoint, that's pretty clever, you know, way, a way to redress a kit and everything. I mean, it's a business. And, uh, when I think about what goes into making a mold, I can't blame them for never throwing one away and, you know, constantly repopping it. You pretty much have to. Whoops. You know, I got this long cord for this thing, which is great because I can move around, but man, I'm always stepping on it. And it, oh Lord, it, this thing, I couldn't lasso a fence post, but with this thing, I can whip it. I can accidentally do stuff I can on purpose. <clears throat> Catch one of the legs, locks on the tripod of a tug on it. So I got to be careful. Let's see what you guys are saying here. Oops, come on. Well. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> I need a boom operator. <laughs> He's a boom operator. Oh, I'm sorry. I promised I wouldn't sing anymore. Um, so i uh, show you the jigsaw puzzle. When I spread all these parts, oh, let's put this back where it belongs. So when I poured all the parts out, all the itty bitty bitty pieces were, uh, in a separate little bag. So I just spread them out where I could see them. And it's kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle, but they're all here. Or at least they appear to be. Um, oh yeah. One thing did happen last night. And it's just the kind of thing that happens to everybody. Fortunately, it was a fairly insignificant part. Oh, no. No, 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 no. How did that happen? Anyway, there's a, there's a seat that glues into the turret, and I glued it hard, and I put the turret in place. Somehow the seat popped out and stuck to the glass on the turret. I'm not taking this thing apart. I'll wind up destroying it. I have to get in there with something and... Oh, okay. Problem solved. You can't really see in there anyway, so... Well, this model now has an official rattle. Don't you love that? You always know when your model lost a part inside. The famous, there's something loose. Oh, hey, it popped out. Well, by the time I paint the frame on the glass, you're not going to be able to see in there anyway. So, uh... Oh, boy, just, you guys have seen my shame. Anyway, it's ironic because it was working on the turret. There are two arms that mount the gun inside so they can pivot up and down. And they wouldn't go on the uh, the gun. The, the holes were a little bit too small. And let's see, it's right. It's these two little arms right here. Yeah, right there. It's these two little arms that go on each side of the gun. So I'm sitting here with my uh, <laughs> reamer, <laughs> and I'm get one and slides on. Oh, good! I'm doing the other one, and something, and it just just bing, 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 bing. Like, yeah, I'm never finding that, and the part's black on top of that. So I'm like over there sweeping up the floor and everything, trying to find it, it's sifting through the trash. I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm a 59 year old man and I'm sitting here sifting floor trash remnants looking for a plastic part of it. Yeah, big! I'm just going to glue the thing in place. And that's why the rear gun does not articulate. <laughs> um, but uh, you do, this is one of those models where uh, it is worth detailing the cockpit a little bit because there's so much glass you will be able to see inside. And uh, now the other one Oh yeah, here's the here's the paint scheme. I'm, I'm probably going to put it in. Nice straightforward olive drab and gray, or IJN gray, and it's going to have the torpedo. There's also a gray. There's also a gray paint scheme, and uh, I'm, you know, one of the other nice things about LS is look at these beautiful painting guides they give you. Little squadrons and everything. I mean, this is worth this is this stuff is worth putting on the wall by itself. It's beautiful. Ah, oh, artistry. Paint. Um, those paint schemes are not, not the same. Um, 
when you look at the shade of there's two shades of green. So, man, these guys, you know, these kits were made in the 60s and 70s. These guys are really setting the uh, bar. Oh, by the way, something I forgot to mention when I was talking about the artwork. Here, let me just move the camera over. Oops, I instinctively go the wrong way. There we go. Oh, come on. Sorry, guys, I'm making you dizzy. Uh, this artwork was done by someone called, his first initial is K, and his last name is Hashimoto. For a uh, Koku fan, that's the uh, name of the uh, series. And uh, But uh, an artist named Hashimoto did all of those. And uh, that's uh, something I'd meant to mention on the thing last night. So Koku, K-O-K-U-F-A-N, if you're looking for anything online. And uh, if I had a scanner that was big enough, if I had a scanner at all for that matter, uh, I'd probably scan these and post them on the Facebook page or something. But uh, with the creases and everything in them, I'm not sure that'd be. But still, man, just magnificent artwork. Beautiful. I always like profile pictures like that. They're just so clean and have all the detail in them. Um, I actually thought about putting those on the ceiling. The only thing is, if I glue those to the ceiling, it's going to be pretty permanent. They're never coming down. Not that I'm planning to do anything with them, but uh, right now, if I wanted to, I could, uh, you know, still frame it or send it to somebody or something. But once it's glued to the ceiling, that's where it lives until the shed's destroyed. Even if, you know, hopefully that'll just be when the, when the sun grows cold. And... Ah, there they are. I knew they were right here somewhere. You can never have enough table surface. I mean, it's like no matter what you do, you're always short of places just to set things down. All right. Now, when I'm done with this one, the next one in line is going to be the KI-109. Just, uh, you know what? I better not unbag that. The KI-109 will be the next one that I do uh, out of the ones that Hans Peter sent me. And I have to dig up the Elta Stork. Oh, gosh, I gotta quit rolling over that cake. I have to dig up the Stork and the Bulldog. Uh, all right. Well, I guess I should get to work. I kind of enjoyed yakking so much. How long have I been going here? Good God, I don't even know. Uh, before I go, anybody got a question or anything for I toddle off? I could always just leave the room and let the camera roll. You guys could talk to each other. Um, <laughs> uh, Chris, I'm going to give it to you. Just uh, send me your just send me your mailing address. I'm not, I, it was a gift to me. I'm not going to charge anybody for it. Um, and one reason. Uh, I want to give it to you as I know you not only because I know you'll do a good job, uh, but also uh, I'm afraid with these fingers, that stork is going to be so at 170 second scale. I'm afraid I'll make a mess out of it. I'd rather you did a nice job with it, but you do have to send me a picture of it. Um, oh, the Edward. Does Edward not make fantastic kits? Mark Hoover sent me that 148 Mustang and I'm looking at the chops to get into it, but I've just got so many other things right now. Uh, it, um, I, um, oops, sent, uh, one or one or two viewers have, uh, I gotta be careful what I say here. I don't want to start a thing, but a, a one or two people who went through the, who've been with me since this whole thing started, uh, that I've seen their work, they do great work and they, and they were like, you know, if you want to unload that and I've had so many wonderful people send me so many kits that it, you know, I thought, you know what, they'll do a better job with it than I will. So yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I could, I would never sell anything that was gifted to me. I might give it to somebody, but I would never sell it. That just to me just wouldn't, that that's getting away from the spirit of the thing. That's one of the reasons I don't monetize. I want this to be what it is. And, uh, you guys are great and we're all having a grand time and I want to keep it that way. Uh, the, um, jets are going overhead. 
Uh, but the uh, the best one of the things I, I one of the things, oh, by the way, just I thought probably had, I have noticed I see a lot of your names, and I'm sure you see mine on a lot of the other YouTube channels that I watch. If you guys I see over comments on the Chieftains channel, or uh, you know, uh, or military history visualized, or uh, military aviation visualized, and you know, uh, it, it, it's uh, I don't know any of those other YouTubers. I've never, I mean, I've sent them emails and stuff, but or made comments, but I've never met any of them or, or talked directly with any of them. But it's it, it doesn't surprise me that we all tend to see each other in the same. Uh, the, the same names, the, you know, over there. And I figure most of us probably have fairly similar uh, 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 subscription pages. Get your magnifiers. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I don't know if I would call this good news. I'm going to say the silver-ish lining to the current world situation is that even when I do go back to work, I think I'm still going to have a fair amount of time for this, which is good. Um, so, uh, that's, um, uh, I find that oddly pleasing. I may be taking a hit in the income for it, but you know what? There's more to life than money. I mean, my bills are paid, so I'm not sweating it. Uh, you know, provided nothing unforeseen, you know, I better watch myself. I'm going to wind up, you know, cursing myself here. But, uh, the older I get, the more I realize how important it is to enjoy your time here. Morning, Claire. Um, so, anyway, as I said before, I'll, I'll reiterate a few issues and then I'll head on out uh, because to be completely candid and give you TMI, what goes in must go out. Uh, the um, if you if you built a Tom Daniel kit, send me a picture. I'll I'll try and put together a segment. A few pictures are still trickling in. I. The whole viewer build thing is, is uh, I've got a few photos for number six. It's, it's something I'm not putting a lot of effort into. It's, it's a back burner project, but um, there's so much else going on. But when I do get enough pictures, I'll put one together. But a couple of folks have suggested that, uh, that TD would be, uh, Tom Daniel kits would make a good segment or, or their own video if I get enough. So go ahead and email them to them, maxosmodels at yahoo.com. And... Uh, I think I'm going to sneak the Rommel's rod back in here and put a little more weathering on it now that I saw some of the work you guys did. I am not worthy. <laughs> I appreciate it, but I don't, I don't, I don't accept money. I don't, uh, I don't uh, do Patreon or any of that stuff. Uh, this is a hobby and the minute money gets involved, you know, it's, uh, you guys know how that goes. And, uh, I, uh, but I do, first off, you folks have been so generous. I've had so many kits and other things gifted to me that I don't think I'll be buying another model for a very long time. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm still gobsmacked by this. And, uh, I think my stash, uh, given the ones that Han Peter gave me is above 70 kits now. And, um, but, uh, I bought those two P40s because I wanted to redo the, uh, Pearl Harbor video I had that got taken down had 974,000 views and I don't monetize YouTube. So it's, it was strictly a way of keeping score, but it was my number one video and it got taken down probably for using some foot. Cause I used the stuff found on the internet and probably used some copyrighted material without realizing it or maybe. And, and the thing was no one ever said anything. I never got a, 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 a what do you call it? I never got a, a, a strike that I know of, or a, um, warning or, uh, this is being demonetized or anything like that, or take it out. It was just gone. Like somebody logged into my account and deleted it. So I don't know what the story was behind that, but, uh, I figured, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, I just wish there was one button you could push to make all of your videos, you know, not for kids because that's a thing these days. And it, uh, but uh, I thought about uploading everything onto BitChute as a backup. I have a few videos out there. I have Max's models on BitChute also. Same same stuff. But that's just too many videos to do that with. It would, it would take me a week just to upload everything. Um, so, uh, but you know what? Uh, the whole YouTube thing is great for because we get to do this kind of stuff. Uh, which is, I really think, I, I absolutely refuse to try and turn it into a money-making thing. 
if it ever gets to the point, like if I was to retire or something and I needed a job and I decided to monetize YouTube, I would, I would approach it with an entirely different, uh, approach. <laughs> um, right now I can do what I want. You know, we can do what we want and it's very happy go lucky. This is a hobby and I want to keep it that way. That's one reason that I, although with the, like Tom Daniel Dornier, I really want to take my time and do a nice job on that. And I want to do a nice job on all of them, but I just don't get fanatical about it because after a while it starts becoming work and it kind of loses the fun value. And uh, everybody, of course, you have to decide for yourself what your fun value is. You know, you know, at what point do you go, okay, this is getting to be too much of a keister, too much trouble. Just like the launch umbilical tower, uh, I'll probably just work on that in the background it, it, it's not a front burner anymore because not only because it didn't it's not turning out so great but also it's it's so i hate to say it like this but just freaking tedious um i also notice a lot of them that have been built a lot of people leave a lot of that stuff off they just want the tower and everything that just looks good with the rocket uh even the ones i've seen like the smithsonian lack a certain detail because there's a certain point where you're just you're just adding detail that no one's going to appreciate. It's like when people hyper detail the inside of a B-52 and then close the plane up, you can't see any of it. They know they did it, and I think that's why they do it. It's just purely personal gratification. That's what this is about, having a good time, enjoying what you did. But me personally, I'm not going to put all that in. I'm going to, I'm going to throw all that stuff in my spares box because if you're not going to see it, what's the point? Um, but again, that's, a, that's my standard. I'm, I'm not being critical of someone else who, who likes to do that stuff, good on them. Um, happy accidents and good times and, you know, make, make it the way you want it to be. Make it what you choose it to be. And keep it fun. Don't stress out about, oh my God, this model's not turning out the way I want. The only time I get stressed about a model not turning out the way I want is if I'm doing it for somebody else. Oh yeah, yeah, Dave Park, uh, Wait, was that John? I'm thinking of John Parker. It's a uh, guy's got a YouTube channel. Does also does kit model histories, and um, so oh well, I think that's about everything for this morning. I hope you guys have had a good time. This was, as you can gather, completely unplanned. Um, I don't even know how much battery I have left. We've gone an hour and seven minutes. Not bad. Okay, so uh, still putting together stuff for Saturday night. 6 p.m. East Coast time. I'll be doing that from inside the house with the big computer where I'll have all the pictures and everything. And, uh, and I'll have some stuff outlined to cover. And uh, if you guys have any ideas or suggestions, just email them to me. Uh, oh, one quick note. If you want to make sure I get a message from you, uh, it's best to email it because I check my email fairly regularly. I, I'm not really on Facebook that much. I put that up more as a convenience because some people it's just easier for them to send pictures through facebook but email is really the way to max's models at yahoo.com uh not not you can't but i just don't check the facebook page that often so if you're sending it to facebook i'll get to it eventually but i don't check that every day um and uh one, one of the problems i ran into is i wound up with so many avenues to get information that i i started losing track of them I mean, it was just me heard a guy did a fully detailed navy that's right. That exa no, I agree completely. He knows he did it, and that gives him uh, joy. Okay, absolutely. I'm the opposite. I, I would have, I, I just, well, maybe on a C-130 where you could look in there. I detailed the inside of my C-119. I even put a guy's head in the uh, Astrodome, taking a sextant shot. You can't see any of it. And I completely forgot it was in there. Um I don't say I didn't like hyper detail, but I did have the full crew and everything in there. And that was the last time I did that. Just, I was kind of like, meh. One of the things I'm doing, <clears throat> I'm planning to do this Peggy, uh, sitting on the ground with the props turning, uh, since it's got come with ground support equipment, I plan to make it like they're getting ready to launch, you know? So I deliberately did not put the crew in the, uh, the gunner in the turret because he wouldn't be there yet. Remember the crews stay in the middle of the airplane during takeoff and landing and then take their positions once they get, you know, towards the combat area. So I'll have the three guys in the cockpit, but they're the only three crew members you'll see because that's where they would be. You know, people wouldn't, and so that was uh, actually a deliberate decision. Um, but uh, uh, the, um, 
but yeah, absolutely. If, if, if you enjoy doing that, just because you know it's there, that's great. That's the whole idea is to do it the way you want to do it. And don't let me or anybody else tell you how you're supposed to. Morning, morning, morning. Uh, and I uh, flew a C-130. Yeah, I've ridden C-130s uh, when I was in the Army. And actually, one time they let me come up and sit up by the flight engineer and pretty much go the whole ride course was staring out. Is at night going? But I was going into Newburgh, New York. Uh, it's funny you should mention C-130s. It, 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 I think the only time I rode in the cockpit of C-130 was from Fort Campbell to Newburgh, New York. And I, I just knew we were going to West Point to train cadets. I didn't know it was Newburgh. And now I fly into Newburgh regularly. And the thing I remember is when we all piled out of the airplane, because that's the only time I ever parked on the air guard ramp. Um, we all piled out of the airplane. And this would have been 1980. Uh and I saw an old Cessna O Warden bird dog in army marking sitting there parked on the military ramp. And I was like, what's up with that? Because I knew the bird dog hadn't been in the inventory for the army for years. And they said it was the West Point Flying Club. And it was like their only airplane. Oh, morning, Kenneth. Oh, Kenneth, Mr. Sandwa. Uh, uh, Kenneth is the one who sent me the little Sandwa hurricane. He's the one that has a great collection of uh, Sandwa models. And he has the only joystick controlled motorized one that anybody in the, in the entire internet seems to have and uh that's a real i was just thinking about that this morning kenneth uh that's a real rare thing uh that's one of the few kits that if some that i would never build just because it's kind of almost a museum piece at least as far as i know maybe there's a bunch of them out there but there's so much obscura in models that oh who one of y'all sent me Ah, uh, was Chris, was it you that sent me the, uh, Ravel made a model of a kitten. Sassy. Who makes a model of a kitten? Well, who makes a model of a butterfly? I mean, I guess they were just trying to expand the product line. Actually, that doesn't really surprise me, Ravel, because Lou and Royal Glazer, who, who, uh, Lou Glazer was, you know, the head of Ravel, they were, they were actually had backgrounds in education. Uh, I mean, they were like, they wanted to make educational toys, which after a while they did, but they, they were the ones that were criticized in like 71 or 72 about why are you making so many war toys? And, you know, there are a couple of California peaceniks, you know, they, they, they had no love of war, but they, they wanted to make other stuff, but they were like, look, this is what sells. Uh, on a grand, pretty much, I wouldn't say, which is where most of your civilian stuff. And, Aurora was the movie life franchise stuff, you know, all the monster figures and everything. And, and Ravel was kind of known as the airplane company. So it's, they had to, you know, they had to keep the doors open. You kids, C97. Yeah. C90. My dad was a B29 mechanic during the Korean war in Alaska. And the C97 of course was like the double decker B29. That also was the 337. The uh, Stratocruiser, very problematic, a very capable airplane, but also very problematic. A uh, lot of maintenance, and uh, well, by the day they were pretty quick. My my brother brought up an interesting point. Everybody talks about, oh, you know, flying in the airlines of the old day, you know, bone china cooked meals and all the free liquor, you know, yeah, that was to take your mind off those four barking radials outside going wah 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 wah, you know. Um, you spend nine hours crossing the freaking Atlantic against the wind with those four monster corn cobs out there barking at you. You get out there and play. Of course I'm drunk. That's not, but I'm still deaf. Um. <laughs> All right, let's face it, folks. Our grandparents are tougher than we'll ever be. I wish these comments would stay up there. Let's see. Yeah. Oh yeah. The body parts seen a tooth and an ear. Yeah. Yeah. They. Pretty much the human body and every part that they're in. In fact, a few, the first oversized, not one to two, but two to one double size were like human eyeballs and stuff that I saw. I don't think I ever built one, uh, but that was their attempt to get, you know, combined models with education. And you really do learn a lot when you read those things. I mean, if you have any interest in medicine, you, you that may good, look great in a doctor's office. Heck, half of what I know about cars I learned from uh, building model cars. Oh, well, these, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if I was a teacher, I'd, that'd be a way to try to get kids into modeling and learn something at the same time. Um, 
But, uh, <laughs> you know, you mentioned war stories flying. One thing I've learned as a career civilian pilot, I, my military flying was all in the back of the plane, mostly in helicopters. You know, uh, I was in the infantry, 101st Airborne Division. And back when I was, you know, young and immortal, um, you look at pictures of me back then and go, what happened? I'm like, <laughs> age and gravity and a lot of beer and pizza. Uh, yeah, I built a few figure kits. I built um, a couple of Godzillas. Uh, well, actually, I built the one Godzilla. That one was paper. Uh, I built a Mr. Spock, but that was vinyl. Um, and uh, and I botched the pat face so bad that my wife actually went and repainted it for me because she, she does dolls and it looks a lot better now. Uh, um, but I, ha I haven't done that many. Uh, I don't think I ever did any of the Aurora horror scenes or anything. But... Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I wasn't really that impressed with the Aurora King Kong or Godzilla. The, the Godzilla's okay. Uh, the, the Aurora King Kong just, I mean, he's got to have fur. You know, he's an ape. And every, no matter how you paint him, he just does just something. And people always put a gloss on it. Like, anyway. Uh, uh, now, the Knights would be something more that I'd be more inclined if I was going to build a figure, something like that. Uh, if I was going to do the monster kits, uh, yeah, the Beatles, nobody, that's right. That was a total uh, boondoggle. They finally realized that's just a marketing failure. The kind of people who go to the, you know, go to the Beatles and aren't normally, the, normally aren't the kids that are building models. I think that was the, anyway, um, if I was going to do the monsters though, I, I, that's something that I'd really want to hyper detail because that's a character that's. A lot of facial features. My wife and I are big fans of the TV show Face Off, so I'd really try to do a good job on those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, to me personally, Kong was the most disappointing. Maybe one reason I didn't buy it. Just because you're trying to make a hairy ape out of plastic. It was just something that was, to me, just it was a disconnect. But uh, wow me with it. And, and Or, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not judging anybody's builds. Good Lord. <laughs> I take photos of mine when I see them up on the screen. I'm like, whoa, look what I missed. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, I was going to tell you is that one thing I've learned is you can't compare war stories with the military fires. Uh, I'm talking about bad coffee, rough weather, and low visibility landings, and they're talking about dodging missiles in the treetops. So uh, you are never going to, you are never going to uh, be able to compare war stories with the military guys. They, they really are the been there, done that guys. And uh, the stuff, I want to I want to share a quick story with you, just tell you how things have changed. I don't know if you guys, uh, yeah, yeah, in fact, not only did Aurora make the sports figures, but i got a quick story for you about that. Uh, um, the Godzilla mold, which I think Atlantis has now, was labeled Willie Mays. Now, you guys know the mold inserts go in these big frames, and this, all this stuff's super expensive. So, and they try to reuse this stuff. So, uh, the Willie Mays model that they made of their sports heroes, uh, series didn't sell. So when they made the Godzilla, they used the Willie Mays frame, pulled out the inserts, made the Godzilla inserts and put them in there. And when, um, years later when they were trying to figure out what was in the inventory, everybody, like, well, what's this Willie Mays thing? They opened up and there was a Godzilla mold. Uh, Hey, look what we found. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I'm touching the screen trying to get the uh, words, the, the, the comments to come back up. Yeah, it's true. They they, they did. Uh, they they were they, they were because they're trying they were trying to make everything they could because they could think of because they're trying to keep people interested. They're trying to keep kids interested. And, you know, new was well, if you ever guys watch Mad Men, uh, he said that uh, you know there's one thing that that, that that keeps people buying the word new. It's like a salve, and it is. Uh, they want the new, the best, the new and improved. They you know that's why like. Soap and detergent would change the shape of the bottle and sell it as new and improved. Even the formula was exactly the same. Uh, but, um, no, heck, there was something I was going to tell you that I completely got away from me. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The military then and now. Uh, a guy I used to work with, Reg Fisher, sadly uh, passed away some years ago. Uh, yeah, the amoeba. Yeah, now that was, when you're making models of an amoeba, of course, you got to have your little Star Trek. Starship Enterprise to go with it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, um, so uh, Reg was telling me when he was a young lieutenant in the Air Force, now mind you, we're talking the late 50s, okay, 
Jets went Mach 2 and cars had tail fins and AM radios. Uh, anyway, uh, and 240 air conditioning, baby. Two windows down, 40 miles an hour. Uh, uh, so uh, he was flying F-104s out of, uh, I forget where it was. Anyway, uh, uh, it was the weekend. Now, the Air Force for a while had something called the ACE program, the Accelerated Co-Pilot Enhancement Program, where... On weekends, uh, yeah, blowing up a lot of trees, I'll bet. He, he, on weekends, uh, the pilots could check out a trainer, T-37 or T-38, and just go home and see their parents or whatever, just to, just to give them some stick time, because they were always flying in the right seat, getting some pilot and command time. It was a great program, except these guys kept running off and getting themselves in trouble and weather and stuff. Um, and uh, so... Reg, it was Friday afternoon. Everybody's getting ready to go home for the weekend. He had a friend that was based uh, somewhere, in, I think it was at Moffitt, uh, up near uh, San Francisco. And he was like, hey, sir, I'd like to, if I could, you know, take my jet up to Moffitt Air Force Base and you know, right off the training, you know, flight or whatever. And I have a friend up there. And now, mind you, it's before the day of cell phones or anything. So uh, it, the, the base commander was like, yeah, cut him, you know, took two seconds on my typewriter to cut him an order. So it's Friday afternoon, and he just walks out to the flight line and checks out an F-104 Starfighter and flies to uh, Moffat. And back in those days, you could still go supersonic. I don't think he did on that trip, but he's kind of like, so do, 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 flying my F-104, you know, uh, taxpayer money, going up to uh, see my buddy in Moffat, you know, training flight and lands. Well, he gets there, tries to call his buddy, because... And the reason he didn't call in advance, in those days, it was long distance and it cost money. So it was better just to show up. The plane was free. The phone call cost money. And other things no one ever said ever in the 21st century. Um, so he, he lands. He gets there. Calls his buddy when he's on the base. He can't find him. Apparently, the guy was gone. So he's like, oh, what the heck? I'll spend it. He, had, he told me he had $11 in his wallet. And I remember this is like $11, $19.59. So... You don't want to wear, you're, apparently they had rules about where you could wear your flight suit and your bags. So he goes down to the uh, base exchange and for like a buck 75 or two bucks buys a pair of shoes, like loafers and a real cheap shirt or something, you know, for like six bucks managed to buy some cheap clothing. And then he goes to the officer's club and for $2 has dinner and then stays at the, the visiting officer's quarters for a buck and a half or what. So anyway, the next morning they gas up the jet and he returns to his home base and he still has like two fifty. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, and he had breakfast too. Uh, and the part I find uh, um, the most incredible about that was that you know you could spend a night in California for seven and a half dollars or nine dollars or whatever he spent. But uh, and when he landed, he had to tell him he was coming. He lands and they. Uh, they had to get enlisted man out there part of the jet and he hops out and that's it. You know, that, that was all there was to it. Try to do that in the modern air force. Yes, sir. I'd like to check out an F-16. Go see my what? <laughs> um, now your, your unit commander would laugh so hard. And, uh, when I was in the army, <clears throat> we had a, I was in a parachute club and we had a Oscar Deuce pilot, a Cessna Skymaster, the, the O2, who, uh, used to come down and jump with us. And, he said it was, although he wasn't getting to fly jets or anything, well, hello from Hawaii, hello. Although he wasn't, uh, although he wasn't getting to fly jets, although they promised him an A7 when he uh, finished his tour in the Oscar Deuce. But he said, although he wasn't getting to fly jets, he goes, you have to understand something. He was still one of the last guys that could just take the plane and go somewhere on a weekend, go see his parents or whatever. Because a Cessna, fuel, a Cessna Skymaster flying all day burned about as much fuel as a B-52 does cranking its engines. So... He had, he had a lot of freedom that it was, you know, just sort of the whole squadron. So it was like, you know, we work hard, but it's a glorified flying club. But, you know, you get in the big expensive jets, it's another animal. And, uh, and to give you an idea how things have changed. Now, this is 19, you know, uh, Reg was doing that in the late 50s. And the other guy was doing it in the early 80s. But when I was working in uh, around 1990, working up in D.C., one of the people who was working part time with us was... Uh, a near retirement OSI uh, investigator for the Air Force, Office of Special Investigation. They're, they're CID, they're their criminal investigation division. Air Force calls it OSI, Office of Special Investigation. And they were investigating a couple of captains who took a phantom to Myrtle Beach 
and through their golf clubs and the travel pod, which is basically like a drop tank, but it's for equipment. And apparently the way they, they sold the weekend at Myrtle Beach was is they were, there was a big air show or something down there, and they were going to go display the jet. And so they arranged to display the jet, the Phantom, and I guess the way it was supposed to work was they were supposed to stay with the airplane and talk to people, you know, kind of a recruitment thing. But when they got there, they parked the jet, put a sign out in front of it, you know, to talk about the airplane. But they went to the hotel and played golf all weekend. So that, that fell under the fraud, waste, and abuse thing. And uh, so that's just how, they, you know, things have changed. And I understand. But off ah, the good old days, we could just check out an F-104 and go sailing off to uh, California. Parent took us to line 74. Yeah, it's it, it's hard to appreciate things when you're young. Uh, although I always appreciated my models. Uh, <laughs> I was a kid at Christmas. All the square boxes, my name. I'd rattle to see if there was plastic shaking inside. <laughs> this better be a model. Nothing, no noise. Nothing moving. It's probably socks. Um. Well, okay, guys. I really have to go. Uh, I got to get to work and. Uh, uh, what time is it? I don't even, well, does it matter? Does it matter on a day off what time it is, really? Oh, 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 I keep saying I have to sign off, and then, like Columbo, ah, just one more thing. Uh, all right, can I do this without knocking everything over? Stand by for disaster. Sounds like the beginning of Stingray. Anything could happen in the next 30 seconds. All right. Here is the Kate from, uh, from Mania. It has a, you can't really see it, but it has a fully detailed interior, a full engine double. I mean, there's like eight parts to the motor under that cowling. Um, and uh, it has a complete interior with the navigator's table and everything else. And the wheel's trying to fall off. So just set that down. Hmm. Now, here is the one from uh, Nito, and like I say, it's Nito that it has the folding wings. Okay, be very careful. We're hunting wabbit. Chip. There we go. Whoa! Gently, slowly catches the monkey. Still don't know what that means. Heard that in that movie, A Piece of Cake. No, 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 not A Piece of Cake. Uh, Dark Blue World. When are we going to cat? When are we going to the combat? Slowly catches the monkey. Okay, there it is with the folding wings. All right, but it has the spinner, which I don't. I've never seen a picture of. A, I've never seen a, a picture of a cape with a spinner. All of them I've seen just had the prop mechanism sticking out front. And uh, but there's there's literally just the three pilot heads. There's no uh, there's no detail to it inside at all. And the entire front section is the, the entire front uh, cowling engine is just one stamping. Um, the irony is, is that unless you look really close, you, it's hard to appreciate the extra, the extra work that went into it because the detail is just so small in these 170 second scale aircraft. Oh, that landing gear is just a dangling there. But, and there it goes. But, um, so, not you know if you're if you're if you're a, a passionate detailing model builder yeah you definitely want uh, the the maniac oh the props what happened there it's probably where i set it down on the let me just prop it up on that <laughs> pardon the fun okay put that over there before i lose it but anyway so you know they're both cool models don't get wrong they are what they are Anne Boleyn. <laughs> oh, that's cold, man. That's cold. Anne Boleyn model comes complete with detachable head. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if I was a kid buying one of those two Kates, I'd probably do it based on which one was cheaper. All right. Now I'm really going to go. I just wanted to point that out real quick. And, uh, a couple of you guys caught the McHale's Navy reference last night. I made my PT boat, PT-73. <laughs> I don't know. The Japanese makes some pretty good stuff. Okay. Well, Chris, don't forget to email me your address. And uh, I'll uh, I'll go dig that thing out. Uh, I'll dig that stork out right now.
I got to get the bulldog out also. Um, so, uh, guys, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And remember, Saturday, 6 p.m., good Lord willing, the crick don't rise. If you don't see me pop up live stream, then something happened, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh. Wow, this is this has really been a, a raging success. I'm, I'm, I'm just tickled paint. Thanks for joining me, guys. We'll see you guys later. You take care. Have a wonderful day and model on.